It's time to strap in and get ready for the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Karting. Dan and Dirk are live in the studio today, ready to hear from you at 402-573-0590. Good morning to you, race fans, and welcome to the Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs online at joeskarting.com. Fast-paced white knuckle racing just across the river, 23rd Avenue in Council Bluffs. Get over to Joe's today. If you're one of the unlucky few still up in the Omaha metro area, I know there's a lot of our race fans that are down here today for the uh, Kansas Lottery, or excuse me, for the Hollywood Casino 400 at Kansas Speedway, which we're going to be heading to in just a little bit. Dirk, good morning to you, bud. Good morning, and thank you to Arch Purdue Auto Sales for bringing you this live broadcast. Absolutely. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, their li their inventory coming up in just a little bit. And speaking of what we're going to be talking about, we'll recap the race that happened at Talladega. That was a bit of a shocker, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And then uh, we had uh, quite a few interviews we're going to get to. Kyle Weatherman, who's going to be in the 99 today, and Landon Castle, who's going to be in the double zero today, and both of them driving for Starcom Racing. And then uh, in turn number three, we're going to sit down with Derek Cope, who is team manager for Starcom Racing. Kind of do a little bit of a year-over-year -year retrospective as where the team's at from when we talked to them at Kansas this time last year. And then uh, in uh, following up, finishing up turn number three, Ross Chastain, who we had the, uh, I had the rare privilege to talk to early in his career at Iowa Speedway. We caught up with him again uh, after the Xfinity race yesterday, which was just as unpredictable as the Talladega race. Yeah, it was not a good day for Ross yesterday. <laughs> and he, then, uh, he, he finished the race in a modified. Yeah, he did. <laughs> in turn number four, we will preview today's race at the Hollywood Casino 400 and uh, take any phone calls that you guys want to field, predictions on today's race, thoughts on Talladega, and then moving forward, who do you think is going to be the four guys that are going to get eliminated after today's race at Kansas Speedway? Ooh, ooh, I know, I know. <laughs> we think we know, but oh, do we really? So let's talk a little bit about Talladega. Quickly, the results. I mean, that was just such a fluke that the Stuart Haas racing cars were able to, I shouldn't say fluke because I don't think it was a fluke at all. I think that was a perfectly executed plan on top of four incredibly perfect cars for Talladega. It's looking like a true Stuart Haas homer. Well, is there any other way to put it? Well, I, I've been I, telling you all week that was the weirdest thing i ever seen. And we even talked to a couple crew chiefs this weekend yeah. that reiterated that, you know. That no other organization, whether it be Hendrick, whether it be Penske, whether it be Chevy's, Toyotas, or Ford's, nobody else was able to match up and give those guys a run. They would catch them, and it was basically a battle for who could finish fifth. Well, what it amounted to is we've seen over the years, we've seen a lot of teams, you know, the four-car teams, Hendrick or Stuart Haas or, you know, back in the, the, the Roush Dynasty days, you'd see them pair off in groups of two. Yeah, in the tandem style. Yeah, you know, and, you know, they'd, they'd run the whole race with a teammate. This was the first time that four cars hooked up and nobody could touch them. Mm -hmm. You know, they went out there at the end of the race and they had driven out to, what, a seven-second lead, yeah. I think? and it was just insane. You know, and if that yellow wouldn't have come, you'd have seen Stuart Haas have four cars, you know, four wide at the finish probably, mm -hmm. and, and it would have been anybody's game, but... uh the yellow came out and, you know, changed the whole scenario. And To Kurt Busch's dis displeasure, he <laughs> felt the yellow was out for just a lap or two too long. Coming out of turn number four, uh, actually coming to the restart zone, uh, Kevin Harvick had ran out of gas on the back stretch, putted around, and uh, got to, got to, uh, uh, got to pit lane and was able to get some fuel in it. He ends up finishing... 28th, I think. Yeah, 28th. 27 points on the day, finished third in stage one. He won stage two, so he got himself a bonus playoff point, which is critical at this round. And uh, in, it, so he was the worst of the of the uh, Stuart Haas finishers. Uh, Kurt Busch ends up coming home. 11th or somewhere around there. 14th, Why am I maybe? having such a... 14th. 14th. Uh, won stage one, finished third in stage two, led 108 laps. He finished 14th with 41 points on the day. Also out of gas. Clint Boyer and Eric Amarola, the older, the other two Stuart Haas racing cars, finished 1-2. Eric Amarola with getting the win, and a uh, big win for him. He, you felt like he had it last weekend at uh, Darlington, but... Dover. Uh, excuse me, yeah, d in, but gave it away. Uh, just a, a hard-fought race, and, and he was able to survive Talladega and, and get back in the right spot to, for this weekend, and he punches his tickets ticket to Homestead. Excuse me, to the round of... Round of, uh, Round of eight. eight. Yeah, sorry. I was 
still I'm, I'm hearing I'm hearing guy. round of eight because we were all day yesterday at the Xfinity race here round of eight and, and which they're in round of eight now but uh, anyway sorry so he posted he punched his ticket onto the uh, the round of eight Clint Boyer comes home second as I mentioned Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in third Denny Hamlin fourth and Joey Logano your top five Almondinger, Johnson Jones Menard and Reagan Smith uh, substituting for Casey Kane in the 95 ends up finishing your top 10 position. Again, the worst of the playoff drivers, Alex Bowman continues to dig a hole, finished 33rd, six points on the day. Chase Elliott finished 31st, 10 points on the day. Ryan Blaney, 29th, 18 points on the day. And Kevin Harvick, like we mentioned, 28th, got 27 points on the day. Stage racing is a critical point to him being able to to, to recoup his day. Yeah, but the one thing that, you know, uh, Elliot didn't have to worry about it. Elliot, you know, all yep. he had to do was climb in the car. He could have parked after a lap, you know, because he'd won Dover. So yep. he was already moving on to the round of eight. So, you know, you can kind of throw him out of that mix. But there's uh, Kyle Larson team. with his penalty yeah. that could, came down. He's, what, 36 points back, I think. Uh, He's basically got to win. Yep, get that in just a second. Kozlowski finished 27th. Kyle Busch finished 26th. And Martin Truex Jr. finished 23rd. That's the worst of the playoff drivers. Again, the other one, uh, Kurt Busch finished in 14th. Not a bad day for Kurt Busch at 41 points on the day. So that leads us to our points. And we talked about it last weekend with uh, Martin Trucks Jr. struggling at Dover. Uh, he was, wasn't was too far ahead of the cut line, and now he is the first car at the cut line, just 18 points above ninth place Brad Keselowski. So Martin Truex Jr. with all those bonus playoff points, everything they learned last year, struggling to pick off the pick up the bonus playoff points this year, and, and now you can kind of begin to see his frustration with uh, with Jimmy Johnson at the end of the Charlotte Roval. People said, "Well, Martin, you know that that was unsportsmanlike, yada yada yada." No, that was five bonus playoff points that it could be critical. He has some sort of an issue today, and I know that we say issues can happen, but. They do happen. Remember this time last year, uh, Kyle Larson went into this round thinking he was the bee's knees and he was going to be going his. He was he already had his ticket punched to Homestead, and the wheels came off that car really, really fast. And I believe two years ago it was Martin Truex Jr. that had a similar thing happen to him. He was eliminated, or was it? Yeah, I think it was Martin Truex Jr. was eliminated in the round of twelve at Kansas Speedway when he had a pretty good lead going into the round. Yeah, but it was. As normal, it was Talladega that really bit him because yeah. he ended up with like a 38th place finish or something mm -hmm. Talladega in that round. But he has never, uh, I mean, two years ago, he had this race wrapped up and uh, had the, uh, I think that's when the valve stem got caught, broken off by the lug nut deal. Mm -hmm. And that's when he was figuring out new ways to, to just screw himself every week. <laughs> yeah. you know? He was finding ways to lose races. And last year... You know, that didn't happen to him. You know, everything went his way. And this year, it's kind of like back to normal for poor Martin. Back to uh, below the cut line right now. Brad Keselowski is 18 points behind. Ryan Blaney, 22 points behind. Both of those guys have a snowball's chance in Hades of pointing their way into the round. They're going to need something to happen like what happened in the Xfinity race yesterday where the front of the field goes into turn one, somebody breaks loose, takes out four or five of the top contenders, well, the and all of a sudden is, this shakeup. The problem is they're in the front of that field. They're both in the top five today. Okay, but they're going to so. need something like that to happen, and obviously they're going to need to survive that in order for an 18-point below the cut line and a 22-point line below the cut line to, to, to be able to point them way in. Well, yeah, but, I mean, when they're starting, I think, third and fifth um, – they're obviously both contenders to win. Yeah. You know, they've had fast cars all weekend. And I was looking at the stats last night, and on their 10-lap averages, they were both in the top five there, too. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that could change depending, you know, on, you know, if we get some cloud cover, you know, and the sun's going in and out. If it turns yep. out a day like Friday, you'll see comers and goers all day long. But if it's like yesterday, yesterday it was sunny all day, and uh, the track stayed pretty consistent. Kyle Larson left Talladega 26 points behind the cut line. Uh, it was announced on Wednesday that he'd received a 10-point penalty for uh, violating the damaged car policy. Uh, I didn't get much clarification as far as what it was, but basically when they repaired the car, they used unapproved parts to repair the car. They've, uh, they uh, appealed it at Kansas on Thursday morning. It was denied. They appealed it again Friday morning. It was denied. 
So he is stuck with the point penalty uh, in the uh, in, in the loss. So he is now 36 points behind the cut line, still sitting in 11th place of the 12 cars contending for the championship still with Alex Bowman 68 points behind. Larson's probably in the worst position of them all. Well, and he come down here and he crashed his primary car in practice Friday and brings out the backup car, didn't get a lap before qualifying. And 27th, I think, is where he's starting today, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. He, he didn't make it out of the first round of qualifying, so he's below 24th. And he has an average finish at Kansas of 26th. Yeah, but Ryan Blaney says he runs well here. <laughs> I think so. Ryan Blaney is just being nice. They're, <laughs> they're pretty good. Apparently, they're pretty good friends. And so Ryan Blaney was just trying to be nice to his buddy. But, you know, Alex Bowman, 68 points behind. He can't point his way in. He has got to win in order to get into the next round. Yeah. And only 60 points available for today's race if he happens to win both stages and win the race. And that would uh, that would. That make uh, Martin Truex Jr. would need to wreck and finish uh, dead last. So tough, tough go for Alex Bowman, but it, it's really simple for these guys. I think Bowman and Larson are in the same spot. Just win. That's all you got to worry about. You don't have to worry about who's where at where, you know, it's not going to be another Charlotte where they're talking about so many positions uh, that you got to pick up or get in front of this guy and you're in the next round. Nope. It's just win the dang race. Blaney and, and Keselowski have a chance to get in on points if there's something crazy that happens today, but Kansas is usually a pretty safe track for a lot of these guys, unless you're Martin Truex Jr. So well, it'll be interesting Kyle to Bush, see what happens Kyle today. Kyle doesn't matter. Kyle's going to point in no matter yeah. what happens. And if you didn't see the race yesterday, uh, that was get a chance to go to NASCAR.com or go to ESPN.com or, or NBCSports.com and, and check out the, the opening round, the opening race, because I've – Never seen cars pile up like that in, in turn one. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a bad deal, and uh, I mean, I was happy to be talking to one of my officials' buddies right there at the start of the race, and he wasn't a happy camper because <laughs> now the his day, his turn. day just got a lot harder. <laughs> yep. So again, Martin Truex Jr. eighteen points above Clint Boyer, twenty one points above Kurt Busch, thirty points above, and Joey Logano in fifth, thirty nine points above Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick. They just got to have clean days. And frankly, if I was you in your uh, in the five week contest or in uh, the season long contest, I would stay away from Kevin Harvick and Kyle Busch. Oh, yes. because the the only reason why they would gain you big points is if they had the opportunity to. Both of those guys are going to see the win and they're going to go for it. But if they're sitting back in tenth, they're not going to push for ninth. There's no advantage to them getting the extra point at this at this stage in in the uh, in the race. Well, I was going to say, you know, but. You're talking Harvick, who's you know on the outside pole, so he's obviously a threat to win. Kyle yep. Busch was somewhere, I want to say he was seventh or eighth because mm -hmm. you had five Fords and then the four Gibbs cars all qualified together between sixth and ninth. I just don't remember which spot Bush was in, but uh, obviously he goes out to win. He don't care you know yep. what's going on, even though he knows he's in. So if you think your driver can win and you can pick one of those two guys for either the five-week contest or the season-long contest, go ahead and pick them. Because it's, it's not like they're just going to go in the back and park for their teammates. Yeah, this isn't going to be, a, gonna this isn't gonna be a Joe Gibbs racing guys at, at, uh, at Talladega a few years ago when they went and just sat in the back and, and pointed their way into the race. Yeah, you can't do that on a mile-and-a-half track. You've got to go ahead and get out there and try and win. And you got nothing to lose. And if they do win, they... It comes out that, uh, you know, if, if something does happen to Martin Truex, you know, that they can, you know, knock him out of the playoffs. And, mm -hmm. of course, I think that would be Kyle Busch's happiest result for today is if Martin Truex wasn't able to move on. Well, I mean, I mean when we talk about the big three, Harvick and Busch, their, their goal today is to find a way to, to knock Martin Truex Jr. out of the playoffs. Cause and him that's... and Brad, make sure they both don't move on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think Brad's that much of a contender when it moves on. They, they, the, he's, he got hot really quick, and then he's fizzled out recently. Yeah. I just I, I don't feel like if – He's still qualified the top five, and he's won here before, so yeah. he's got to be a threat. All right, uh, we forgot to mention at the top of the show, and we need to take a minute to do it. I want to send our condolences out to a uh, fellow racer down in the Kansas City area, uh, Mike Tanner, who had uh, raced jet, uh, jet chassis for several years, uh, passed away suddenly, I believe, Friday as uh, after complications to a routine surgery. Uh, so please send your thoughts and prayers to uh, his wife and to his stepson, and uh, to his whole racing family, Mike Tanner, uh, rest in peace, bud. And uh, we'll be thinking of you a lot today. 
and over the next coming weeks. If you want to get involved, we'll try to share some information once something uh, firm comes out about uh, charity fundraisers. Usually they do the uh, Tanner Strong stickers, which I'm seeing them up on Facebook already. So we'll try to share those as far as uh, making sure that they're the right places that that money is going to. Uh, so keep the uh, Tanners in your thought as Mike passed away suddenly after uh, routine surgery. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in turn number two. We're going to sit down with Kyle Weatherman and Lane and Castle, both behind the Starcom Racing Machines in the Cup Series today. We'll be back on the front stretch. Finding a home can be the most important decision in your life. It's the simple factors of neighborhood, garage size, the school district, and commute that get overlooked by most realtors. Those are the aspects that Jim Blazina has been focusing on since 1988. From rental properties to your forever home, the race and realtor will work hard to get you exactly what you're looking for, and he can help list your home for a speedy sale. Contact Jim Blazina today, 402-980-8400, or jblazina at npdodge.com. Every race car driver has run into the same problem. It's well past normal parts store closing hours, but you need that one to finish your car. The guys who brought you White Knuckle Racing by the River bring you Joe's Karting Racing Parts and Tire Store. Open until 10 p.m. Monday to Thursday and open until 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. A parts store that fits your after-hours schedule and you can turn a few laps at Joe's Karting while you're waiting for your part to get pulled from their warehouse. Joe'sKarting.com for more information. Dan and Dirk are rolling into turn two with a little attitude on the front stretch. There's a joke that could be said there right now, but we'll, we'll leave it alone for the fans to not have to endure what you've endured the last couple of hours. Big D. All right, uh, welcome back to the front stretch. Rolling into turn number two, and we're going to sit down with a couple of drivers from Starcom Racing. First one we're going to talk to was Kyle Weatherman. He's in the 99 today, and uh, they uh, Starcom Racing has been racing that number 99 for uh, periodically throughout the season, as uh, we'll find out from Derek Cope is the reason why. But uh, Kyle is the uh, benefactor to that race. So we sat down with Kyle in the number 37 for today's uh, Hollywood Casino 400. Excuse me. He's in the 99 starting 37th in today's race for the Hollywood Casino 400. And we wanted to uh, find out how uh, he got hooked up, uh, how his career has brought him to the 99. Yeah, so I started when I was eight racing go-karts and stuff like that. But uh, my dad taught me very early to work hard for what I want. And uh, I learned very early in my career that this is something that I want to do for, for a living and, and, you know, do it professionally. And, uh, you know, so I've just uh, kept my hat down and, and, and worked really hard. And, and uh, luckily, that's really how I got into this opportunity here is just working really hard and, and uh, being at the right place, right time and, and you know, networking and, and being around people that can make, uh, you know, decisions like this. So Go through the working hard part for me a little bit because it, it obviously gets different as you're going through the stages. And I, I think it could be difficult to understand what aspect you got to work hard on yeah so i mean obviously making my craft as a race car driver is the number one, number one pri priority uh so anything i can do to better myself as a race car driver whether it's uh you know working out uh you know throughout the week getting you know mentally prepared like that or or uh, working in the shop with the guys working on the race car knowing more about what i'm actually driving and then uh you know obviously you know thursday friday saturday you got to start studying really hard on film and and uh, you know, getting yourself prepared for racetracks that, um, and, and I've been to Kansas before, but you know, um, p you know, last year, uh, you know, or in you know years pre uh, previous, I haven't been to uh, you know Chicago, so I had to start you know really studying hard and and trying to learn more about you know the bumps and the characteristics of that racetrack, the grip level and stuff of like that. So, uh, you know, luckily I've surrounded myself with with people like Landon Castle, Chris Bush, or David Reagan, uh, that have got a lot of knowledge on these racetracks. Derek Cope, obviously as well, my uh, team owner, and uh, you know, just uh, having a lot of resources like that obviously helps as well you said you got started in go-karts first of all what area of the country you're from and what were your steps between go-karts and cup or was it just one giant leap for, for <laughs> i don't think i've ever heard of that one but uh, no so i'm from winsville missouri uh you know so really there's not a lot of racetracks around there there's peevely missouri which is you know about 30 40 minutes from there uh yep yep so schrader he's uh he's got a really cool racetrack up there and uh you know so we've we've been there a couple of times that's really i guess where that's where my first race actually was was at peevely uh you know so that's 30 minutes from home but uh, other than that you know just had to really start traveling and uh even with the go-karts you know we went to uh, kentucky a lot we went to charlotte uh you know you know there's iowa racetracks you know so there's a lot of racetracks you know somewhat close to home that we had to just travel to and and go out and uh, you know just find where the competition was and make myself better as a race car driver and uh, that's what we did from the go-karts on up uh, i believe you raced uh, truck series a little bit arca also and then uh, a little bit in the xfinity series and now you're up under the cup yeah yeah so we went uh you know go-karts legend cars bandoleros uh, did a little bit of late model racing and then just uh, a lot of the ARCA stuff. And that's really where, 
uh, you know, I think prepared me for, you know, this level and stuff like that. Uh, the ARCA series is an amazing series. The racetracks that they go to are obviously the racetracks that we're going to are at this level as well. Uh, you know, just the horsepower that they have to compared to, you know, the weight and the tires and the grip level. Uh, there's a lot of characteristics that uh, can relate to, you know, even these cup cars here. Obviously, horsepower is a big difference. But uh, when it comes down to it, you know, especially since they went to these composite bodies over in the ARCA series, uh, and there's a lot of uh, comparisons and, and stuff that you can take off of, uh, you know, that side and, and somewhat compared to here, you know, and obviously there's a tons of tons of things different, uh, you know, from each level. But, uh, uh, you know, the ARCA series definitely prepared me, uh, you know, fairly well for, you know, coming to this level. And, and then just the other other hand is, you know, just studying film and, and talking to other drivers that have been in this level for a while and just, um, you know, paying attention. And, and that's that's easy. That's free. You know, so that's what I try to do is just uh, pay attention and, and just watch what's going on around me so I'm prepared whenever my opportunity arises. You're in the process of learning these cars, like you just said, about how they react, the different horsepower. And then we find out a few weeks back that we're going to be getting a whole new aero package for 2019. Do you kind of throw your hand up in the air and be like, well, Great. Now I got to learn stuff all over again. Yeah, I think NASCAR is really good at, uh, you know, I guess letting you learn and get to a point and then they'll completely throw it around and, <laughs> and change everything they just did and, and you know, go backwards on it. Uh, but, you know, it, it really just still brings out, um, you know, the driver and everybody. You know, obviously everyone's going to have to relearn stuff and, you know, everyone's going to have to start at a new slate again. And, uh, you know, I guess that's really, in, in my opinion, kind of good for me as well. You know, obviously I don't have a lot of background of how these cars used to drive or are or, or supposed to drive, quote unquote. And, uh, you know, I guess it just you know, maybe helps the learning curve on, on my aspect a little bit as well. You know, just uh, since everyone's kind of got to start at, uh, you know, the same same slate, you know. Take me back a little bit. You said that you would uh, oftentimes watch film. Are, are you watching um, team footage from inside the car? Are you watching analytics from data pulled from the car? Or are you watching TV broadcast film? Both. Uh, you know, anything I can find on YouTube is obviously, you know, my my search history, you know, before I go to the racetrack is is Kansas anything. So any, anything I can find Kansas or the racetrack that I'm going to the week before, uh, you know, I just try to find any film, whether it's in car whether it's, uh, you know, just, you know, Martin Truex making a qualifying lap, whatever it possibly can be, uh, you know, just, to, like I said, pay attention. And then obviously anything on YouTube is free, so it's, it's all free to, to watch. And like I said, just, uh, you know, paying attention and getting as much information as you can uh, before you come to any of these racetracks is obviously beneficial. You talked about being hands-on with the car. Uh, so kind of expand a little bit that, that you're more of the hands-on guy because it, to me there, there seems to be two predominant types of guys that would prefer to describe what the car is doing and let the crew chief and the car chief figure it out. And then there's the guys that, that they can feel it and they know what the problem is because they've worked on these things before. Do you fit in that second category? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not you know, hollering out changes and stuff like that of what's going on. So, I mean, I'll definitely let... Uh, the crew chief make the calls and the decisions, and, and I'll you know put my input of what I possibly would think or or, or what I'm feeling is, is the main feedback that I'm given, and I'll let them make the calls and and uh, and when they make those changes, I'll put that in my memory bank of you know hey we just lowered the left side track bar half inch, this is how it felt after I went back, you know what I'm saying? So I'm keeping all this knowledge and, and building up all this knowledge to where you know if uh, you know if I do come in one time like you know later on and and uh, you know the weeks that we're going or whatever you know hey what, what about you know what about this that it worked down in Kansas maybe it'll work here. You know what I'm saying? So I just I do my best to you know remember the changes and, and how they felt to where uh, you know you know weeks you know previous from where we're going or whatever you know it can um, potentially make those changes as well again. Probably remember the ones where he says, "Well, that didn't work." Yeah, yeah, de de definitely, got to remember the ones that don't work. But uh, you know, you definitely got uh, got both sides. You got to remember, got to remember everything. If you could pick a driver in the Cup Series that you you your si style is very similar to, who would you say it'd be like? Uh, well, I'm trying to make my own craft, you know. So obviously, I want to be my own race car driver, and I'm not gonna uh, try to be like anybody. But there there's a handful of drivers that I pay attention to and, and respect and watch, you know, consistently. Uh, unfortunately, Carl Edwards doesn't come to the racetrack anymore. Uh, you know, but I really respected everything he did on and off the racetrack, how he represented himself, how he speaks, how he, he talks, everything. Uh, you know, so if there was one driver that I would really like to mold myself kind of into would be, you know, Carl Edwards. Like I said, I just really respect how he treats his fans, how he drives a race car. 
Uh, I just everything he does, you know, I really respected everything he does. Uh, you know, obviously Chris Busher is a really good friend of mine. David Reagan's a really good friend of mine. Uh, you know, being over here at Starcom, Landon's been a really good fan of mine. And so uh, there, there is a really good group that I have built up around me. And uh, like I said, I'm just trying to, for one, create my own, my own mold and, and be my own, you know, race car driver, my own, my own style. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's also you know a ton of people around me that I can learn from and and uh, try to uh, you know create my craft and and make uh, make the best race car driver I can. It's been great talking to you. Really do appreciate your time. Kyle Weatherman going to be in the 99 on Sunday for the Hollywood Casino 400. If you haven't got your tickets yet, get on down to Kansas Speedway and get them and make sure to root on that Starcom Racing 99. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And again, he'll be rolling off 37th for today's Hollywood Casino 400. As soon as we get done talking with Landon Castle, or excuse me, with Kyle Weatherman, we uh, sat down with his teammate Landon Castle, who's been racing a majority of the races in that double zero this year. And uh, we started talking with the Iowa native about his season with Starcom and the goals for the season and what it means uh, when they're trying to build a notebook for the future, but still being a budget friendly operation. I, I think. Wrong interview. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to <laughs> trying to get some some more inventory and. And really figure out what this program can look like. You know, we we feel like if we can get uh, maybe a little bit more consistent fleet of cars um, for the future, um, that we can get some better performance and on on the track and more consistency that way. And and really just kind of figuring out this team chemistry for a team that's really started from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't a team that was purchased out of a team that went out of business or anything like that. There's really no, there was no chemistry to begin with. It was just starting from scratch. So um, that's a that's a real challenge. I mean, that's a hard way to start a race team, um, but it's it's fun for me to be a part of for sure. It's got to be frustrating at times though too, because where most teams get a full set of tires, they get to use their their the the limit that NASCAR will allow them to purchase. You guys are running about half that amount, and so you know you're a little handicapped going off the start uh, yeah i mean we we buy the tires i mean we don't have um we haven't really had any tire issues um this year i mean the team does a good job of getting us sticker tires and um you know, a lot of times we're bringing tires from home or something for practice which you tend to can practice on older tires that way or um you know in the race you might be buying tires from from other teams but we tend to be uh, you know derek does a good job of getting us stickers every week you know, the biggest challenge is really just having having the cars prepared as, as well as we need them for every single race and having the inventory. Um, you only, we only have so many cars in the shop right now. And, <clears throat> you know, as a, for a growing team, we're trying to, you know, build up our production capabilities and our manufacturing. And, and, and those are the challenges that we see, you know, these guys just, just, uh, work their tails off. Um, you know, and it's, and it's in, as far as racing goes, it's never enough, you know, you always need more. So, um, you know, as a team, we just need to continue to give them more and more tools and equipment. Now you talked about building up the inventory. I know we talked to Derek clear back in the spring, and it was in between Phoenix and California, and the primary had got uh, beat up at Phoenix, and so they had to pull the backup car out, which was the primary for California, and change everything out mm -hmm. for the short track car, and then run the car, and then put it all back to the California car to go race there. So. I, I just know if you got more cars, how much work that saves on the crew. Yeah, for sure. You know, if we can just have more complete stuff and have more components and, and things like that. And, and that's what Derek is trying to do. That's what he's trying to build towards. Um, but, you know, to start up a race team, it's, it's awfully expensive to get everything you need, the engines, the charter, all that stuff. And um, you got to pick and choose where you spend it. So, you know, these teams, as they grow, they get better and better. And, and you know, I think the next, like I said, the next step for us as a team is, is to have more inventory. There's been a lot of talk about the aero package for 2019, uh, the all-star aero package, what they're calling it. What's that going to look like for Starcom Racing? Um, I think it will, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to the aero package because I, I don't mind seeing a little more spoiler back on the back of these cars. I know we, as the, the drivers sort of champion taking downforce off the cars quite a bit, but um, yeah, I think the, where we kind of missed that is, is you know, we would all love to have the downforce off the cars, but you still got to get the grip back somehow and didn't really seem to be that way. It would be nice to have some softer tires or bigger, you know, maybe Goodyear make a bigger tire or something like that. But, um, yeah, I kind of like I like the idea of having the spoiler back on the car, you know, give you something to lean into. Um, um, I'm kind of anxious to see that. Um, but the racing on intermediate tracks is going to be a lot different next year with um, – basically the the tapered spacer um going 
cutting as much horsepower as it's going to cut. It's going to be a lot different racing. Are, are you expecting the field to tighten up a little bit? Are you guys going to have a little bit more shot at 25th, 20th? Um, I I don't know. I mean, I think that I I think that we can be closer to to those guys for sure. You're still going to have to be better than them to beat them. You know, it's not all of a sudden going to make us better than them because they're going to be, you know, we're all getting the same thing done to our cars. Um, it might close up the field a little bit, uh, but you know we're still going to have to be able to outrun those guys. We're still going to have to bring good setups, good cars to the racetrack for sure. Well, we've only got five more races to go. Yeah, can you believe that? <laughs> this this year did seem to kind of fly by. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we say that every year. Yeah, it, it yeah. might maybe. What's the what's the yeah. off season look like for you? Would you come back to Iowa? Just going to hang out? Um, I don't know if I'll make it back to Iowa, but um, I don't know. I you know my wife really wants me to take her somewhere tropical, so <laughs> I might try to go. I might try. To uh, go. Yeah, Iowa. Yeah, I might try to find a beach somewhere, and maybe in January. Yep. Yeah, there's no beaches in Iowa. <laughs> no beach. Not 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 in January. <laughs> not a beach you want to be at. Yeah. yeah. No, not in a way. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, hey, man, it's great catching up yeah. with you. We love to see you again. Uh, and Always a best of luck this weekend and, and today at the uh, Hollywood Casino 400. Thank you, guys. And I'll see you at the next Kansas. And you'll see uh, him starting 35th today in the double zero. That is Landon Castle going to be in the Share Foundation Chevrolet for Starcom Racing. Yeah. I mean, Landon was brought into this deal because if, if you remember how this season started, they had Jeffrey Earnhardt in the car. And Jeffrey just kind of found trouble. You yeah. know, he. Uh, he tore up some equipment, and when you're trying to build a team, that's the last thing you need, and that's kind of been one of Landon's things throughout his uh, career. You know, he's doesn't have a win yet. You know, not a bunch of top fives, but he takes care of the equipment. He doesn't take unnecessary risks. And uh, what we what we say? Think maybe he damaged two cars this year. Yeah, that's all I can remember is uh, it, maybe not even two. I think he might have wrecked one, and he was just caught up. Oh, you know what? Who he was caught up in an accident with? Yeah, at Indy. Yes, <laughs> I do. Yes, Mr. Jeffrey. So it might have been one or two, but uh, yeah, Landon's, you know, he's doing a great job for the team. The communication level is great. They're building their notebook. Um it, it's easy to look at that team and say, oh, well, they're running back in the 30s, so they're not very good. They're not trying. They're underfunded. Uh, they're, a, they're a decent funded team. They've got decent equipment, but they're just kind of chilling for the first year to two years. I mean, and keep in mind that they've just completed their first full season as a Cup Series team. And and the fact that they're they're running as well as they are, the fact that they're able to run a second car uh, to get a little bit more data, which we'll we'll talk to Derek Cope coming up here in turn number three. You know, it, it says a lot about the strides they've gained over the last uh, year. Well, and it it showed yesterday to uh, Landon's professionalism. He was over in the Xfinity garage after the race, yeah, and saw him talking to several crew chiefs, a couple drivers. He was wanting to know what the track did throughout the day, mm -hmm. so he can kind of you know put that in his mental notebook about what's going to happen today. And, you know, it, it's got to be frustrating for him because it was announced uh, Friday afternoon that Joey Gase would be back in the car next weekend at Martinsville. So while Landon's making some pretty good strides, he doesn't have a full-time ride. And I, I mean, i got to imagine as a competitor, a guy who wants to be behind the wheel 100% of the time, that's got to be a little frustrating for him. But he continues to work with the team and, and get them what they need to, to learn so that they can have successful years down the road. Let's take a quick break. We're going to come back in turn number three. Our interviews with Derek Cope and Ross Chastain still to come on the front stretch. Every race car driver has run into the same problem. It's well past normal parts store closing hours, but you need that one to finish your car. The guys who brought you white knuckle racing by the river bring you Joe's Karting Racing Parts and Tire Store. Open until 10 p.m. Monday to Thursday and open until 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. A parts store that fits your after hours schedule and you can turn a few laps at Joe's Karting while you're waiting for your to get pulled from their warehouse. Joe'sCarting.com for more information. Today's live show on the front stretch brought to you by Archer Purdue Auto Sales, located at 14227 S Street in Omaha. They've got a great lineup and selection. They'll be open up at noon, ready for you to take advantage. Yeah, uh, still don't know if they're open on Sundays with that uh, construction work they were doing out in that area. They were closing for a while. Uh, have not heard from Brian whether they are back open on Sunday. But uh, you can check their inventory out at archpurdue.com. And uh, 
they'll probably have the hours posted uh, whether or not they're going to be open this afternoon. Uh, might be a bad day to skip the race, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, like I said, you can see what they've got. You can uh, give them a call out there. They're the uh, original home with $140, $149 a month payment, and uh, they'll work with you and try and put you in something nice. Find them online, archerpurdue.com, and thanks to those guys for supporting this year's live shows on the front stretch. 402-891-1100. Hey, look at that. You're sitting on your couch playing Halo, Madden, or NASCAR while your friends are at Joe's Karting. Each lap is an adrenaline-filled, heart-pumping, white-knuckle experience that you can only get at the Metro's largest indoor karting track. Eco-friendly Honda engines rip you around their professionally designed road course at breakneck speeds. Can you reach the 14-second lap bracket? There's only one way to find out. Put the controller down and get to Joe's Karting. 23rd Avenue in Council Bluffs next to Quaker Steak and Lube. This week's Young Gun on the front stretch is 26-year-old Tyler Hollywood Mushick, who's in his third year behind the wheel of a sport compact. After being a lifelong race fan, Tyler decided to get behind the wheel of a race car when his younger brother purchased the sport compact. Not being one to let his younger brother have all the glory, Tyler found his own car, and they've been blazing a path for future Mushicks to follow them. Behind the wheel of his 05 Cavalier, Tyler has competed at Lincoln County Raceway and Eagle Raceway. With the help and support of his father, Tyler has racked up 5th and ninth place points finishes at Eagle Raceway over the last two seasons, respectively. This offseason, Tyler and his dad plan on building a new race car in hopes of finding his first A feature win and track championship. Tyler plans on adding the letter B to his number for his son Bentley and soon-to-be-born daughter Bristol. Make sure you keep your eye out next time you're at Eagle Raceway for the Freds at Parkway 23B, driven by this week's young gun, Tyler Hollywood Mush. Feather the brake and get back to the gas. Dan and Dirk are headed into turn three on the front stretch. By the way, it's worth noting as we head into turn three, if you have any young guns that you want to get nominated, we had a big list we've done since uh, early 2017. We're going to continue them as long as the uh, as the young gun names come in and we're able to get the profiles completed. we got a big list to get through, so we'll be going through probably April or May of next year, but... We're always taking new people. We need. I know there's new kids that are joining the sport. And, and when you say a young gun, you automatically think like a kart racer. But, you know, like Tyler, who's in his 20s, but in only in his third year of racing. So it's, you know, it, it, there could also be a older generation that you finally got around to buying that sport compact or, or whatever the reason is that, that you got your car. Uh, and you may be in your 20s or 30s, but it's only your first few years in the sport. When I hit the $1.6 million, or billion dollar, excuse me, well, i got to get, get that extra zero in there. But when I hit that lottery and I've got mm -hmm. my own late model, I'll be a young gun. Dirk, you you actually do qualify for being too old for the young guns. <laughs> and it, we and, found our limit. <laughs> and it, it doesn't have to be just circle trackers. If there's any junior dragster drivers or something out there, we'd yep. be glad to hear from you guys too. Turn three brought to you by Kansas Speedway. Tickets for the Hollywood Casino 400. Still available at the gate. Get them today. Look, $39, $49 for adults. I can't remember what the kids' admission is, but it's pretty cheap when you're under 12. Uh, just get down to Kansas Speedway. People love to sit here and criticize how boring NASCAR is, and I'll, I'll agree that at certain times it is pretty boring on TV. It is not in person. There is so much to do, so much fun. It's going to be a beautiful day. Grab a jacket, maybe a stocking cap and some gloves. If you're in the shade, it's going to be chilly. If you're in the sun, it's going to be hot. And uh, grab your soft cooler. Yeah. Uh, just don't bring any glass. Uh, you can bring your adult beverages. You can bring water. You can whatever you can fit in one of those little twelve by twelve fold up coolers. Mm -hmm. uh, food, drinks, whatever. And everybody in the party, if you mom dad and the two kids come you can bring four of those little coolers so everybody can be taken care of you don't have to worry about buying extra beer you don't have to worry about spending a bunch of money at the concession stand because I've, I've always heard i've heard the horror stories of taking a kid to a to a sporting event and dropping a, a hundred dollar bill on on some popcorn a couple of pops and a pretzel you can bring your soft-sided cooler into kansas speedway you can have your lunch here you can drink you can you can have a gay old time yeah i mean if you've never experienced it uh we were able, through a uh, Chevrolet engineer, to get some garage passes for the Xfinity race for some people yesterday. And I had thought that they'd had garage passes before, but they never had. And, man, were they just amazed. Yeah. 
it just and even like doing the fan walk, being able to go down to driver introductions and you're just feet away from these drivers, being able to see the cars up close and personal and then going up into your seats. And I'll tell you, I will never forget the rumble of the cars going into turn one. The very first time I came to Kansas Speedway as a spectator, that's just something that no matter what sound system you have or high definition TV you have, you cannot replicate the feeling of that live atmosphere. There's electricity in the air. There's the, the rumble of the engines and, and the, the, the vibration on your chest and just the excitement level cannot be duplicated on TV. And some of these guys evidently followed Jesse sobbing around and saw Jesse giving away all his trophies to kids. Some of these drivers now are given their uh, checkered flag hmm. to a young yeah. fan up in the stands. So, you know, what an awful deal. And, uh, you know, you're talking about a fan for life. Absolutely. You know? Uh, get down to Kansas Speedway today. If you're up in Omaha, it's only a two-and-a-half-hour drive. The race doesn't start until 1 o'clock Central Time today. You've got plenty of time to grab the kids, grab the car, get, get on down to Kansas Speedway, and uh, pick up some tickets. We hope you come down. KansasSpeedway.com for more, for more information. One of the teams that's going to be competing, we've been talking to Starcom Racing a lot because this time last year we had the rare opportunity to meet a brand-new team in the Cup Series. First race. They debuted their double zero, driven by Derek Cope, uh, in the uh, Hollywood Casino 400 last year. And uh, it, and we kind of wanted to sit down and talk to him and talk about a year over year. So we got to sit down with Derek and kind of talk about what it was like 36 races later. I, I think certainly we, we've come a long ways uh, in a short period of time. The, in its infancy, we were just trying to get a lot of equipment put together and then uh, obviously showcase the potential of the team initially when we came here a year ago. But certainly since then, uh, the team has escalated, you know, to a great degree with a, a charter and running every race and then running two cars. So a lot to to overcome in a short period of time and a lot to get done with a small amount of people. So I'm pleased with what we've done to this point. I certainly always want to run better and would hope that we could have been more proficient in some areas. And uh, But I still think that we've done a lot of great things uh, and have been a stable fixture in the sport that has been relatively productive. So hopefully we can uh, continue that process. Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of surprised a little bit when we were coming to the race this time or this time earlier in the year in May for the first race, and you guys were going to be debuting a second car for the first time. Unfortunately, circumstances the race before didn't allow that to happen, but I didn't expect you guys to be ready to run a second car that quickly. Well, we really weren't. Uh, obviously, uh, we didn't have a great amount of cars to to work with but we felt like it was imperative to to get a second car out there just so we could have more data to analyze and more opportunities to try things because you certainly only get 50 minutes of practice and most of the time getting through inspection is difficult and you only have 45 minutes to do this so we really tried to use it as a way to try more things and try to get better in an exponential manner but um, certainly uh, it's been a struggle uh, but we have had our good days and our bad days but all in all I feel like we're starting to make inroads here to become uh, way more efficient than I probably expected us to be. To run a second car and a third car and everything, they get cheaper, you know, because it's, I, I don't want to say it's cheaper is probably a bad word, but it's, it's a little less expensive. Is it, you know, like 80% for that second car or is it 95%? The, the business model is really based on two elements that really make it conducive to be able to do it within what the purse would allow. And that's really what our business model was to try to learn from, you know, learn things for the second car. And that is basically that we ran our motors, you know, three races and ran the fourth race in the uh, open car. Uh, so we had no engine bill, basically. And we would run a lot of used tires uh, and try to minimize the amount of uh, outlay. Uh, and then really work to use some of the personnel that worked within the team to do some of the pit work. So all of those elements would help underwrite some of the costs. So that made it to where you could run the thing within its means, meaning within the purse money that you were dealt with and whatever sponsorship that you could procure. So that's how the business model worked to be able to utilize it that way. Beyond that, it is difficult. Uh, it really doesn't make a lot of sense uh, if you can't have some ancillary funding or things to, to go with that, if you're going to try to escalate the productivity of the team, uh, if you're using it as a mechanism to get better or you know uh, make a push out of it, then that's really what it uh, is utilized for. 
would you consider getting a charter for that second car uh, in the next year to two years? Getting a charter for that car probably is more about you know wanting than being able to procure it. Uh, there's only so many of them, and everybody is vying for those. You know, so certainly. If you could procure another charter, it would be beneficial. I think there's a number of you know lower teams here that are are still trying to to do that. I think where we're at right now, we're very fortunate that we're in the position we're in in a very short period of time, and I think we are going to really concentrate from this point forward to really try to come back next year, hopefully be more productive uh, with one car. Uh, beyond that, I can't really speak to it because I don't know what the owners have in mind. But I would hope that we could just address, you know, the double zero uh, better and come here more prepared, make better choices. And I feel like we can come and be, you know, a better race team uh, in, you know, in 2019. So that's really where my mind uh, is at at this point. I believe right now you guys have an alliance with uh, Richard Childress Racing. We don't have an actual alliance. We don't have an alliance with anyone, really. We really are very fortunate, though, that RCR has um, kind of helped us in some regards where we procured, obviously, some race cars and some parts and things for them. Uh, but as far as the biggest relationship we have is the with ECR, uh, Richard Childress Racing, but it's the... Uh, the engine side of it you know we actually purchase engines and they do our rebuilds and things and then you know we'll do some other things with them next year with the engine program so that's the biggest pro part of the uh, of the relationship is the uh, motor program um, you know we don't have an actual technical alliance we really can't afford that nor were we really ready for that uh, so we really couldn't utilize it because we just weren't proficient enough you know so we're really just in the learning curve and you know sometimes you can you know take on too much which I think we have at some times this year with two cars but um, you just have to stay motivated and I think you just have to stay within yourselves and try to try to learn from every you know miscue or every problem or every you know mistake that you make and uh, we certainly have made a lot of those but I think we're finding our way a little bit and I think it's starting to show on the racetrack I think uh, you kind of answered the, the, my next question with your last answer a little bit but I want to ask it anyways just because I'm kind of stubborn and, and sometimes I need smaller words for answers um, with the vacuum the 78 team has with leaving the team at the end of the year and there was kind of a void for a little bit there that has now been filled by uh, Levine family racing was there ever a consideration in the Starcom ownership management level of moving to Toyota and picking and taking over that spot that the 78 is left behind no there was no uh, no thought of that whatsoever um, pretty much our owners are, are very Chevrolet orientated. They wanted to be in a Chevrolet from the start. That was They were adamant about that. So our relationship is with Chevrolet. Uh, so we're proud of that. Um, I've had my you know a lot of success with Chevrolet and uh, I'm excited about continuing that. I hope to endear um, ourselves to Chevrolet a little more. I think I've always been one of those guys where I really don't hate to go in and ask for something when you haven't proven yourselves. So. I'm hopeful that uh, they have given us some things, uh, but I'm hopeful that we can, you know, provide uh, a more efficient race team uh, in the years to come where, you know, they'll, you know, it'll, it'll warrant some help from GM. So that's what we're striving for. Uh, again, we're just doing a lot of things. We're implementing a lot of things that I think will uh, solidify the fact that our race team is proficient and a stable fixture in the sport and will, you know, it'll pay dividends uh, on the racetrack again uh, in, in 2019. The struggles that Chevy has had, the upper teams, the the, the RCRs and the Hendricks, and um, that they've had with the, the the Chevy body style, the new one that they've came out with this year, uh, it seems to be kind of they're starting to get a handle on it. It's a little late in the season, but you never stop building for the future. It, are you able to get any of that information through your relationship with RCR and through Chevy? We really don't get anything from RCR. Uh, we've parasited from other areas uh, where I think that we're gaining on the downforce issues. Uh, that's the big thing. I think they've gained so much in downforce from the beginning of the year. I think the one question will be the Mustang. Uh, you know, next year that car has a lot of indentations and a lot of uh, same types of similarities in the nose that the, the Chevrolet has. So it could provide uh, more issues for them as well. Uh, so, you know, there's always variables in this sport and they continue to come. And you just have to be able to uh, work within the confines of the rules and find ways around them. So um, we feel like we're getting better. We think we're gaining downforce. We are trying things here again here today that I think have shown uh, that we've, we've gained some speed. 
and hopefully we'll use the rest of this year to try these other things we're doing and then that'll set a maybe a I think a precedent for how we move forward in the winter time to get ready for next year isn't it kind of funny that Ford has had has had an advantage this year and they've been incredibly fast and, and now they're going to throw it all out the window and go with a new body style if you were at a Ford, a Ford executive, wouldn't you be looking at the results going, guys, maybe we should stick with what's winning right now? Well, again, the tough part of that, you know, I'm not I'm not nowhere near in a position to uh, to speak to that. But obviously, you know, there is reasons for everything. And, you know, what you know, what wins on sell on, on Sunday sells on Monday was always their adage. Right. So, you know, you got to look at what the what the general public is doing, perception in the marketplace. And so they you know, that's how that's one of the. The key selling points for uh, for Ford is a, is, a, is a Mustang, as a Camaro is for Chevrolet. So you try to work towards those areas, and then that falls, and you know the rest of it falls on the hands of these guys that have to go find ways to make it fast. Which obviously, you know, the big teams have done have done that to much of a, to a degree, like Haas and and those guys. So you got to you know give kudos to them. But um, you know, like I said, this sport. If you ever will look at this sport, and I've been here a long time, from each year. The guys that were winning there don't seem to always come back the next year and be as proficient because there's always a change, a tire changes, the body changes. So that's what's unique about the sport, and I love about it is that you don't know what next year brings. So there's anticipation for everybody when you get to Daytona. Yeah, we, we know that the aero package next year is going to bring some headaches for some of these guys that are trying to find speed, and now NASCAR is going to be taking some, adding some downforce and taking some horsepower away. Yeah, I think that there's something that I. I, I applaud them for. I mean, I think they're trying to find what it, what the sport needs is to you know put you know fans back in the seat, entice them to come and physically see it, and they're trying things that they thought you know maybe showed signs of life at Charlotte, and it did bring I thought some parity to the sport. It uh, moved the cars from the back to the front. They weren't lapped as quickly. Uh, the racing was good. You know, uh, a team that's maybe a mid-pack team won the race and was in a factor to, to win the all-star race until he crashed. But I think it just showed that it did kind of um, help bring, you know, I mean, I think the team's closer together. So if it does that, um, certainly I think racing will be better for it next year. Uh, obviously, to the detriment of some of the bigger teams that spend more money have had maybe an advantage. It probably is less desirable for them. But, you know, this is about racing as a whole right now. And I think, uh, you know, Richard Childress said it best in a, in a meeting, you know, that, you know, you better mind the store here. You better figure out what it takes to get racing better and quit worrying about yourselves and be self-serving. This is about racing. And he loves this sport. And, you know, I, I say kudos to, to RCR for stepping up and saying, you know, changes need to be made and we got to do it for the betterment of the sport absolutely couldn't said it better myself Derek cope manager team owner for starcom racing always do love talking to you can't wait to see you this time next year hopefully when you guys are maybe uh still competing for the for the playoffs that would be nice again Derek cope uh team manager for starcom racing gonna have the double zero and the 99 out today well and just if you if you listen to the way he's talking he has really done a nice job in the transition from uh, the driver's seat to the business side. Yeah. And he's done a fantastic <clears throat> job with that organization. It, it's tough to see the results, but they there's been a lot of compliments from other teams and officials in the garage at how far they've come in the in the last year. And you can't state that enough. When when you, you talk about a sport that the defending championship team is folding at the end of the season – it's easy to say, oh, well, the sport's doomed. But then you've got, um, I, and I can't even pronounce it, but there's another team that's working to come in the organiz- in, into the Cup Series. Uh, and then you've got teams like Starcom Racing that are working hard to, uh, to solidify their position and to benefit the sport. And I, I think with teams still coming in, yeah, the, the 78 story is a tough one for the sport to swallow as a whole. But there's a lot of better stories out there that counter what, what's going on with the 78. Well... And the 78's not in a spot. If the 78 wanted to stay and uh, be in the position to where, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll we'll keep our team together and we'll go out and be happy with yeah. a 30th place finish type deal, you know, they'd still be around. But after winning a championship that, you know, you're well past that goal of right. Yeah. You want top five. You want to be competitive. And that does cost so much more money. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back in turn number four. We'll wrap this baby up. We'll get you set for today's race at Kansas. And we'll hear from uh, Ross Chastain. Actually, 
We don't have time to hear from Ross. We went a little bit long. We're going to take a break. We'll come back in turn number four. If you love wings, if you love rings, and all kinds of other tempting things, great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. If you love wings, if you love rings, and all kinds of other tempting things, great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Dan and Dirk are live for one last corner. Give them a call now at 402-573-0590. Welcome back to it. Turn number four brought to you by Quicker Steak and Lube, the official water hole of the front stretch. If you can't make it down to Kansas Speedway and see it live and in person, then uh, at least head down to Kansas, or excuse me, head down to Quicker Steak and Lube in Council Bluffs. Get yourself some nice uh, Arizona Ranch Wings. Best wings, hands down, in my opinion. And I got the belly to prove that I know my wings. But don't ask to speak to the owner because he is in Kansas <laughs> watching the race in person. He is. Uh, and, and thank you again to Chris. Uh, he stepped up and got us some nice new T-shirts, some really well, nice fabric. and uh, past T-shirts. That's dude. true. There's some <laughs> nice polos with the, shirt, with the show logo on it. So thank you to Chris for helping out with that. And, uh, again, thank you to everybody that helps out with the show. I kind of said out a huge apology. Uh, Ross Chastain, man, he was he was a trooper. We got to the track late on Friday, and uh, and he rescheduled on Saturday, and, and we, we tracked him down after a tough race in the Xfinity Series, and he gave us a great seven-minute interview, and we only have four minutes left in the show. I didn't do the timing very well. Ross, that's totally my fault. To any of the Ross Chastain fans that want to hear it, I'm going to post it as an extra on the YouTube channel as our for our podcast replay. So it'll come up at the end of this segment on the YouTube channel. So just fast forward a little bit if you're listening on Monday morning on the YouTube channel. But I really do apologize. How about uh, and for those that don't have that and don't you know aren't tech savvy to go see YouTube, how about we schedule that thing in and play it next week? I think we could. I think it'd just be a little bit outdated because we talked a lot about the Xfinity Series race. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, still, they want to hear the interview, and uh, yeah. there's some good stuff in there. It was a fun interview to do. Yeah, he's a really good guy. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Kansas today. Uh, starting on the pole is going to be the uh, 22 of Joey Logano. Harvick will start outside of him. Eric Omarola and Ryan Blaney will be row number two. Kozlowski and Jones row number three. Kyle Busch will start seventh. Alex Bowman will start tenth. Truex will start uh, 12th, Chase Elliott 13th, Clint Boyer 14th, and we talked about Larson. He has got a tough road to hoe, starting the worst of the playoff contenders. He's going to be starting 27th. Slow car uh, hasn't quite figured out this track yet, but there is a ray of sunshine because there was a guy named Kyle Busch who was probably worse than Kyle Larson is right now. And all of a sudden, he figured this track out and went to victory lane several times uh, at Kansas Speedway. So there is a ray of sunshine that Kyle Larson could f- strike lightning in a bottle. He could finally figure this track out. They could get the, the line just the uh, the car just right, and we could see a good race today. And we could see him move on. It's just going to be tough. Well, I guarantee you, they made wholesale changes after the uh, uh, qualifying. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, they didn't make it out of the first round of qualifying. So I know they went back and made some wholesale changes. And if by some chance they hit the magic combination, you know, you got a lot of time to move through the field. And, uh, you know, well, you'll probably know in the first 50 laps yeah. on what he's got for today. If he's moved up in the top 10 or 12 in the first 50 laps, then he might have something for him by the end of the day. But if he's still marred back there in 22nd, 24th, or whatever, mm-hmm. he's probably not going to be at the front and not move on. 
If you're in the Pick'em's Contest, either the five-week Quaker Steak and Lube $100 gift card contest or the season-long contest, both brought to you by Rick Haven Ridge of Wealth Partners. Make sure you get your picks in on time. You'll need to have those picks done by noon today. And coverage is on NBC with the green flag set to wave at 1 o'clock. Can't say thank you enough to all of the Starcom Racing people for all of their great support and helping us out with the Crewman for a Day contest. The final one we got to do for the year. Uh, your brother Hugh and, and Dale and, and Sonia have had a great time following the teams around. want to say a big thank you to Zach Ralston of Zach Ralston Racing in the ARCA Series who let us kind of hang out with him during the ARCA Series on Friday night. Thanks to David Starr in the Xfinity Series for letting us hang out with him on Saturday. And now we get to hang out with our Starcom friends uh, for the Hollywood Casino 400 today. And these deals are so cool because my brother uh, brought a friend with him and his daughter, uh, they're camping in the infield, but his daughter was able to snag an er Dale Earnhardt Jr. autograph yeah, the other you, night. You never know who the, who you're going to run into when you're doing this, but uh, it, it's a really cool experience. It's a one-of-a-lifetime thing, and we'll do it again next year as we get free. set. Yeah. As we get set for the May race at Kansas. Thank you to Craig for pushing the buttons. Thank you to everybody back at uh, at home who's listened to the show and all your support. We'll do it again next weekend as Ryan Kitchen will join us to talk about his 2018 race season in the Bade Motorsports Sprint Car. We'll be back next weekend to do it all over again. This is the Front Stretch on AM 590. We all have that coworker that runs their mouth off at how great they are. They shot a five under par, 95 mile an hour fastball, bench press 375, bra. Wouldn't you love to shut them up by school? them at Joe's Karting, Council Bluffs premier indoor karting track, professionally designed so each corner is your opportunity to embarrass your coworker. Call Buddy for your next company outing at 712-256-5278. Joe's Karting, white knuckle racing just across the river on 23rd Avenue next to AMC 17. This has been the Front Stretch Radio Show, presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs. To contact Dan or Dirt, find them on Facebook at The Front Stretch or email them at frontstretch590 at gmail.com. If you missed any part of today's show or want to hear a previous show, subscribe to the Joe's Carding YouTube page where you can find almost every Front Stretch show.